welcome back to From My Mom's Basement, the podcast um, recorded straight from my mom's basement. Um, it's been a minute since I've made one of these, and um, I don't know, I just felt like I was constricted by having to write a short story once a week. I just felt like I'd end up putting out bad content just because I wanted to get that one story a week, if that makes sense. Um, So I decided I was going to stop holding myself to that. Um, But during this quarantine and everything that's going on, I feel like um, I might as well post something. I have a lot of stories on the back burner right now that I'm just not sure um, if they're good enough to post, but I thought I'd go ahead and post this one. Um, this is called The Graveyard Keeper. It's a little bit of a short, uh, scary story. Um, it's written by me, David Chamberlain, um, and read by me, and, uh, I hope you guys like it, so thank you. The graveyard was situated on the pinnacle of a small hill and overlooked the small village below. At one time, it was the largest and most popular cemetery in the area, as it was the only cemetery in the area. But now the graveyard was relegated to a historical landmark, an anecdotal device used by parents to scare their children. And make no mistake, it was rather ominous. Even from the village far below, you could see the ancient stone monuments sticking out like rotten old fingers from the top of the hill. First officially dedicated in 1707, possibly 100 years after the first grave marker was planted there, the true origins of the cemetery are not entirely known. The oldest grave marker in the cemetery is thought to have belonged to a doctor of philosophy, an eccentric man who moved to this remote locale to continue his work on a new, more occultic science, a science in the realm of reanimation, a science that was strictly forbidden by the church at the time. However, this story is only an attractive rumor. No one knows exactly where or when or why this first grave marker came to be, but everyone can agree that this grave marker is by far the most impressive. The name on the marker, which was once carved beautifully in a six-foot-tall granite obelisk, is now tarnished and corrupted, leaving nothing but the last three letters of the name, L-E-R, and it is dated 1610. Most guess that whoever belonged to this marker, possibly the dark philosopher or magician, was of Germanic descent, L-E-R being a common combination of letters in Germanic surnames, Heller, Schuler, Euler, Bueller, Hiller, Himmler, Hitler, and many others all possessed that commonality. This hypothesis could be historically corroborated as there were a small amount of Germanic settlers in this area at the time. But still, the construction of this, the largest and oldest grave marker, and the man who rests beneath it, remains shrouded in mystery. L.E.R. is situated directly in the middle of the cemetery like a king surrounded by his subjects. The other, less remarkable grave markers sit in large circles surrounding this great headstone. The smaller headstones have names like Barker, Swift, Tyler, and so on, all English names. These gravestones reflect the period in the region's history when the English came and proliferated the area, expanding fast and establishing their presence with a fierce staunchness that could only be attributed to the English people. It is thought that it was during this time that the cemetery was officially dedicated. As the radius of English headstones expand, a handful of Irish names begin to insinuate themselves, a Burke here, a Connolly there, and shoved in the farthest corner of the cemetery, almost buried under centuries of weathering and undergrowth, is an O'Flannery. Then, the headstones break away, and an eight-foot-tall wrought-iron fence shoots up from the tall grass, speckled with rust and topped with sharp fleur de leases. As of today, no one visits this cemetery. There is no one yet living who remembers this odd conglomeration of the dead. And the mysteries surrounding the origin of the graveyard do little to entice people to visit. The village below is fond of its historical significance, but outside of spooky tales and stories told in whispers in dark rooms, no one mentions it. No one even so much as acknowledges its existence. No one except for the man who was bidden to keep watch over it. The old graveyard keeper lived in a small house, more shack than house, on the bottom edge of the hill. Some 800 feet above him, perched like a bird in her nest, sat the cemetery. At various, unscheduled intervals, the graveyard keeper would scale the hill, tin of soup in one hand, a lantern in the other, and tend to the cemetery. 
As his joints grew old and rheumatic, each trek to the cemetery became an event, a physical test, something that the graveyard keeper dreaded doing each day. Charged by the local government to keep a continued watch on the cemetery throughout the night and most of the day, the graveyard keeper instead made his way to the cemetery once in the morning, leaving for home before lunch, and once in the evening, leaving before the moon rose. Once at the cemetery, the graveyard keeper would often pull a spoon from his pocket and slowly sip at his soup, without even so much as performing a cursory inspection of the graveyard. Sometimes, if the night was warm enough or the day cool enough, he would spread his long and twisted legs in the tall grass, rest his bald head against the hard earth, and sleep. He harbored no superstition, no religion, and had no time for the paranormal or preternatural. He was paid bi-monthly by the municipality, a meager wage but enough to provide for his creature comforts, his chicken soup, his tobacco, and his trips to the bar. He was happy. He enjoyed working in those hot summer days and temperate summer nights. And it was in one of those nights, one of those temperate summer nights, that the graveyard keeper was killed. The gravekeeper was putting the finishing touches to his soup when he looked up and stared at the painting that hung on his wall. It was an image of a sailboat, out at sea, the winds calm and the sun bright. The gravekeeper thought about something for a moment, and then went back to his soup. Carefully bringing the liquid to a boil, he added some parsley and pepper and then some bone broth. Once the liquid was a nice thick yellow, he tossed in some pieces of already cooked chicken and stirred. This one's just about perfect, he muttered to himself. Reaching behind him, he found the butt to a tightly rolled cigarette and shoved it in his mouth. Smoke seeped out from his nose as he stirred his concoction. Just about perfect, he said again, the cigarette dangling from his lips. When the soup was finished and poured delicately into his traveling tin, the gravekeeper began to ready himself for the trek up the hill. There was a gentle wind that night, and when he passed by his living room window, he saw the low branches of a maple swaying and bowing. The gravekeeper stared at this and thought for a moment. Something's moving out there. Although the sun was still setting, his house was already almost pitch dark in the shadow of the hill it sat beneath. The gravekeeper felt cold as he watched the trees move in the shadow of the hill and felt something unnatural. He massaged his thick mustache and went to outfit himself. It was a toasty night, and yet he still donned a jacket and overalls with a woolen cap. Bending over and with no small amount of effort, the gravekeeper slipped on his tall leather boots and tied them with shaky hands. Then, clutching his tin, now hot with soup, and lighting his lantern, the gravekeeper made his way out to the cemetery. It was later than normal. The last traces of the sun had already turned gray, and even that twilight was failing fast. It would be dark by the time he reached the top of the hill. As the gravekeeper made his way up the trail, he began to whistle a tune he knew from his youth, one his father had taught him. It was a somber tune about a husband who lost his wife. Halfway up the hill, the gravekeeper stopped and checked on his lantern. It was flickering and acting out of sorts. The hell is the matter with you, the gravekeeper whispered, flicking his fingers at the lantern's glass. Suddenly, a strong, proper flame returned to the lantern, and the gravekeeper kept moving forward, every so often peeking at the lantern out of the corner of his eye, almost expecting it to sputter and go dark. When he reached the top of the hill, the stars were already out. By damn, the gravekeeper cried to the cemetery. You're all right where I left you. He chuckled and walked near the graveyard fence, his lantern catching some of the headstones peeking up from the grass. For just a brief moment, he wasn't sure why, the gravekeeper thought he saw a new headstone mingled with the others, one he didn't recognize, one that shouldn't be there. He swung his lantern in the direction of the alien headstone, but found everything as it had always been, as it had been for hundreds of years. The gravekeeper thought long about this, twirling his thick mustache. Huh, he whispered. The lantern sputtered, and immediately his attention returned to his light source. You got plenty of fuel, scolded the gravekeeper. What's going on with you? Turning his back to the graveyard and peering out over the lush valley below, the gravekeeper sat down and worked on his lantern. After fiddling with some knobs and shaking the contraption a considerable amount, the gravekeeper brought back the flame brighter than ever. There she is, he said, petting the top of the lantern like a dog. There was no moon that night, but the gravekeeper didn't mind. He liked looking at the stars, and the stars were out in force. Well, well, I bet that one, that one is Aries right there, he said to no one in particular. <laughs>
After catching his breath from the long walk and stretching his old legs out in the cool summer grass, the gravekeeper cracked open his soup tin. He smiled with delight. I did good this night. I did good. He licked his lips and reached for his spoon. It wasn't there. Oh, but... but. The gravekeeper muttered as he checked all of his pockets. I forgot my damn spoon. With little hesitation, the gravekeeper tilted the traveling tin back and drank the soup straight from the hot metallic container. A warmness slithered its way down his throat, and he felt his extremities start to tingle as a warm wave moved through his body. After drinking his fill, he pulled the canister away from his face, his mustache dripping wet. He burped. Out in the distance, he could see the river, the stars just bright enough to reflect themselves in its current. Well, ain't that something, he whispered to himself. It was very quiet. There was no wind, not any more. The air was very close and still. Far in the distance, he could see the amber twinkling of the village below. And every so often, he could hear moisture in the lantern being evaporated and the subsequent vapor trying to escape. It sounded like a tiny high-pitched squeal, like a microscopic pig being taken to the slaughter. By degrees, the gravekeeper began to tire. His old wrinkly eyes grew heavy, and he finally laid down completely and surrendered himself to the warm exhaustion that filled his body. The cool grass engulfed his body, and before he knew it, he was fast asleep. And then, suddenly, he was awake. His mind was still fogged from his slumber. He sat up and looked around, trying to remember where he was. It was pitch dark. The lantern was completely out. The gravekeeper felt as though it was ten degrees cooler. A quick shiver ran through him. And that primal sensation of panic began to stir in the deep recesses of his mind. The gravekeeper did his best to shut it out. He tried to examine his surroundings. Was there something out there? His eyes were still fuzzy from sleep and lightheadedness. Reaching for the lantern, the gravekeeper thought he saw something out of the corner of his eye, something in the graveyard. What? he blurted. Who's there? he called out. There was only silence. Now the panic was growing. There ain't no such thing as ghouls or ghosts now. Ain't no such thing, he reassured himself. After fumbling with the lantern for a few minutes, he found it to be no use. It wasn't going to light. He smacked the lantern punishing it for its disobedience, and took a deep breath, trying to calm his erratic nerves. He sat silently for a moment, listening and thinking. The night was silent. He began to laugh. (laughs) You is a cowardly bastard, ain't you? He said, laughing. He helped his creaking body to its feet and lifted the extinguished lantern to his side. By golly, I, I, I suppose I slept half the night, he said, looking at the stars. He turned to grab his soup tin. It was gone. What in the hell? He whispered to himself. The gravekeeper began kicking at the grass all around his place of rest. It was nowhere to be found. Well, I ain't believing this, the gravekeeper grumbled. Then that sinister feeling, that ancient, dominant feeling of panic started to rise again within him. Somebody, did somebody come up here and and steal it out from under me? He said, looking in all directions. Who's there? I'm armed. He was not armed, and he was now beginning to be terrified. Who's there? He called again. It was totally silent. His heart beat loudly in his ears. With great reluctance and no small amount of fear, the gravekeeper turned to look into the graveyard. It was still and silent. The headstones stood as quiet sentinels, never moving. Somehow, the gravekeeper felt as though the headstones were staring back at him, as if he were looking into a jail cell and the granite grave markers were angry convicts planning an escape. And then he saw it. There, sitting on top of a tombstone that he did not recognize, sat his soup tin, its metallic sheen reflecting the starlight. This is some kind of, this is some kind of sick joke, he yelled. Who's out there? You come out right now. I ain't afraid to shoot nobody. The world was completely still and somehow he knew that no one was there. Well, this is just ridiculous, he said to himself. I ain't afraid. Total fear was beginning to course throughout his body. Only his pride was keeping him from running in terror. I ain't afraid of nothing, he told himself. He pulled his giant brass ring of keys from his pocket and began the difficult task of identifying the right key while in total darkness. 
His hands shook as he fumbled with the pile of keys, and his old sweaty fingers slipped, and the keys fell against the fence with a metallic crash. The gravekeeper jumped. Oh, Lord in heaven! He cried. He thought he saw something move in the darkness. He picked up the keys and began working with great speed. He felt as though a malignant force was closing in on him, like a thunderstorm moving swiftly on the horizon. Was he hearing whispering? He found the right key and plunged it into the keyhole. The rusted hinges sent out a shriek that punctured the silence of the night. The gravekeeper stepped carefully inside the cemetery, moving slowly and making his every step deliberate and precise. The monstrous gravestone of L.E.R. seemed to tower over everything. It looked twenty feet tall, not six. As he moved further into the cemetery, a fear took hold of him, something that completely clouded his mind and judgment. His breathing became fast and his heartbeat started to ring in his ears. As he came to the center of the cemetery, shapes and shadows began to come alive around him. And yet he couldn't make any of them out clearly. It was as if these shadows were hiding behind the gravestones, afraid to show themselves just yet. The gravekeeper came to his tin. It sat precariously on top of an old, eroded tombstone with a name he had never seen. Carefully, and oh so slowly, the gravekeeper reached out into the darkness to grab his tin. His hand shook violently as he stretched it out in front of him. His fingers took hold of the tin gently at first, and then clutched it with all of his strength. There was a noise coming from behind the gravekeeper, something he couldn't quite identify. He took hold of his tin and turned around, and suddenly there was a loud shriek and then a clang. The gate to the cemetery had swung shut. The echo of its closure hung eerily in the air. The gravekeeper instinctively put his hand in his pocket looking for what wasn't there. Oh, oh, my, my keys, he said to himself. Panic took him completely, and he started off running as fast as his twisted legs would permit, but it was too much for him. He tripped and his face plowed into the ancient dirt. He laid there crumpled for a few moments, unsure if he was conscious or not, and then propped himself up again, his whole body shaking now. Blood and dirt filled his eyes. Something was moving behind him, something sinister and malevolent. Things were moving now, dark things, less afraid, less timid. Something was closing in on him. When the gravekeeper reached the gate, he saw his keys had fallen to the ground on the other side of the bars. They were just outside his reach. He desperately clawed at them from behind the rusted fence, but it was no use. The gravekeeper then knew that they had been thrown, had been moved by something he couldn't see. Heaven help me, he whispered. Tin in hand, he turned to face his fate. When his body was found and subsequently taken to the medical examiner, the cause of death would be declared a heart attack. The doctor guessed that in his old age the climb to the top of the hill had proven too much and his heart had given out. Of course, the doctor made no mention of the odd condition in which the gravekeeper's body was found, laying prostrate, as if in prayer, beneath the great obelisk of L.E.R. listening to The Graveyard Keeper by David Chamberlain. Um, it was produced by me and edited by me, and the music is by the one and only Kevin McLeod. I want to thank you again for listening, and hopefully you'll be seeing more of me in the coming weeks and months. Um, thank you.